Uh, it was pretty negative and expect, expectedly so. Uh, and, you know, one of the major issues I think with Chip Kelly has been, we've talked about it in the past, has been the just how many, the difficulty in traversing the media and how many people cover this team versus what he was used to in Oregon and, and the minutia of the day-to-day stuff. I don't think he handles it well. And one of the things I've always advocated is that he move his press conferences from before practice to after practice. I think a simple tweak like that would ease so much consternation for him. But this is a guy who's so headstrong. Uh, he doesn't think like that. And, and all of a sudden we have these questions about Sam Bradford. Last week it was Jason Peters in the injury situation. And, and one of the questions that, that stuck out to me was, uh, so you don't know if the quarterback, you're the head coach of this football team, and basically you don't know if the quarterback is ready to practice or not. And, and that makes Chip Kelly look bad. And it's something that's easily corrected, but it's not corrected. So uh, it's a little thing, but little things tend to turn into big things, and I think it gives you a, a window into why this team is 4-6. and six. All right. Um, yesterday in that locker room, I mean, you've been around teams, John, where the bottom has fallen out, when the season looks like it's crashed and burned. In that locker room after that game, did it have the feeling of a season that just hit the low point and is ready to spiral out of control? No, I didn't get that. I think it's more of a feeling. I, I, I spent most of the time with defensive guys. I got more of the feeling that they were embarrassed, and rightfully so, and, and they were angry and they were upset about the way they played. Uh, and that was understandable. But I, I think the realization is this division is so bad, they know they're in it. it. It's not – usually when the bottom falls out, it's because guys have given up and there's no hope and they realize – uh, a, a win or a loss next Sunday, in this case next Thursday, is not going to make much of a difference. The Eagles know, despite how poorly they play, they're still right in the thick of this thing, and, and I think that alone kind of kind of keeps it from that point, and and they still believe they have a chance to turn it around. Uh, we're talking with John McMullen, ninety-seven-three ESPN dot com, who's got uh, full coverage on this game yesterday. Uh, yesterday it was uh, just. The defensive effort is that a is that an aberration one week or is that the beginning of the cracks of a defense that is having its Chip Kelly second half wear down? It's interesting because that's what I thought and that's what it could be uh, because this team is is consistently on the field too long. They see a ton of plays and we all know it's because of how the Eagles run their offense and you can talk about time of possession. Uh, to me, the real stinging of that game, you can talk about the 4-yard Martin run, you can talk about the 235 yards, you can talk about the Jameis Winston five touchdown passes. But to me, the low point was coming out in the third quarter uh, and, and giving up a, a monster drive that basically took 10 minutes off the clock, 10 minutes of the third quarter gone in one drive uh, and it was clearly fatigue, along with the fact they had a bad afternoon. There was missed assignments. There was missed tackles. And all that kind of turned into a perfect storm of ineptitude. Uh, but anytime you're dealing with a Chip Kelly coach team and the defensive side of the ball, you almost have to expect them to wear down in the second half of the season. No doubt. Um, you know, and, and obviously yesterday's one of those days where just uh, they didn't have it. They didn't have it on the defensive side of the ball, uh, but they haven't had it on the offensive side of the ball, and the frustration built uh, spilled over uh, John Sanchez and, and Sproles. We saw those two guys go at it. You had an anonymous player call Murray out. Uh, the two receivers yesterday, uh, Aguilar and Matthews, uh, first round and a second round pick combined for seven catches and 24 yards. It's almost un- unbelievable to average 3.4 yards a catch. Uh, but the frustration on the offensive side of the ball, I'll ask two questions. Number one, has that spilled over to the defense? Are they becoming frustrated? Is there a divide because they're carrying this offense? And number two, are the offensive players questioning their roles in this offense now? I think a little bit. Certainly people like Aguilar can't, and, and strange as it sounds, his production was an uptick from what it normally is. Uh, a little bit from Josh Huff because he was kind of demoted, and, and the one time he did touch the ball, he went 30 with a touchdown. And, uh, but 
I think people kind of missed the boat on him because that's what Josh Huff is. That was a, a well-thrown ball, and it was yards after catch. Uh, we always talk about manufacturing touches for him. He's not really a receiver that's going to create separation running traditional routes. Uh, so I think that's the role for him, and he has to understand. I, I don't get that feeling from the offense because I think most of the players realize <laughs> that they haven't produced to the point where they can complain. And and whether you're talking about Riley Cooper, Miles Austin, uh, well, do they Jordan question Matthews. Do they question that they're not producing because they haven't produced, or are they question that they're not produced because they're not being uh, put in the right position to produce? The only player I get that from, and he's too classy of a guy to admit it, but you can certainly tell it by his actions, some of the words he says at times, is DeMarco Murray, who's not a fit for this offense. Uh, I, I haven't really gotten it from anybody else. Uh, and whether it is the fact that the receivers aren't proven uh, or the tight ends, uh, you know, Zach Ertz for, is playing more than he ever has uh, before the concussion yesterday. Uh, Selleck is just, you know, Brent Selleck, he's a veteran guy. He's not going to create waves. And some of it is the fact that, Chip has surrounded himself with guys who aren't going to question things, and that's what he wanted. And to a large degree, I think you see that on the offensive side of the football, with the exception of Murray, and I should also say Sproles, because he's also the one guy who has questioned uh, the fact that he should be touching him a little bit longer. So other than those running backs, I haven't, I haven't seen it from anyone. There's certainly been frustration on the offensive line throughout the season. Jason Kelly, Kelsey, though, knows – he basically criticizes himself. And Lane Johnson is a guy, I think, who who is a little fed up, not knowing where he's going to play every Sunday, whether it's the right side or left side. Uh, but he just brings his lunch pail to work. So to a certain degree, the culture aspect that Chip Kelly wanted is working. You know, the football aspect is the part that isn't working. John McMullen, 97.3 ESPN.com. His uh, take on the game is up there uh, after every game. And, of course, uh, we're looking at some of the things. I want to ask you about Maxwell. Um, I don't know that they're going to come out and say anything, but do you feel there is some resentment towards this guy whose effort seems to be lacking and his production is certainly not where it should be for his contract? But, you know, you watch him yesterday with the effort he gave on some of them plays. Do you feel that some guys – have some resentment towards him well i don't know if any of the players do because i think contract things for the most part are are people understand that if somebody's going to offer you the money everybody's going to take it and i think the eagles are certainly have a buyer's remorse they should be but they should have realized this was not a number one cornerback when they signed him in free agency he was a complimentary guy in seattle uh he doesn't have the skill set to be a lockdown corner in this league uh, in large part in recent weeks, uh, his play had been greatly improved from early in the season. To, uh, I think he, along with everyone else on that defense, took a major step back. The one play that stands out to me is Sims going up and, and grabbing the football from a ball he should have intercepted. That's a running back. Okay, that's not Mike Evans or Vince Jackson high-pointing the football, which you can accept. Uh, that's a running back taking a a a 50-50 ball basically out of the air from a $63 million cornerback. That's not acceptable. Uh, And the Eagles have to understand moving forward in free agency, we all talk about that's not the way to build teams in this league. And when players get the free agency, they're going to get overpaid. So you can't just assume that because uh, Byron Maxwell's a slight upgrade over Kerry Williams or Bradley Fletcher, that that's worth $63 million. That's fool's gold. Mm-hmm. Uh, John, you know, I saw Tampa Bay on numerous occasions yesterday. You know, a guy would get hit a little bit later, a little rough, and they'd had three, four guys getting right there to pick their guy up. It seemed like a team that was coming together at 5-5 five and five, as opposed to what you're looking at in Philadelphia. It looks like a team that just doesn't get along or like each other. Do you sense that this team has personalities that don't mesh? Well, I think the expectations, I wrote about this in the preview before the game. Both teams came in 4-5, and five, but the expectations were so different each city. 4-5 and five is great for Tampa coming off a 2-14 and 14 season. 
with the number one overall pick at quarterback who looks like the real deal versus four and five for a team that was uh, expected to be a significant Super Bowl contender by at least a lot of people uh, around this area and throughout the country. So the same record was looked upon much differently, and the Bucks are, are feeling that way. And, and, and you see the way they act on the football field because they're excited. And the Eagles are disappointed. So I think a lot of it points to that. You're never going to have 53 guys in the locker room. It doesn't matter if Chip Kelly's your coach or Jerry Jones is your owner son in every mystery and off the street. You're never going to get 53 guys who get along all the time. That's possible. And, and when the losing happens and, and you add in the fact on top of it, the expectations for this particular team, guys start pointing fingers, and that's sort of what – uh, developed between Darren Sproles and Mark Sanchez. All right, uh, Lewis Riddick was uh, all over uh, the television today. He, he was asked about where the true problem lies uh, with this Eagles team. I want you to hear his answer and see if you agree with him, and then give me your uh, answer where you believe the uh, true problems lie for Philadelphia. This is what he said. Take a listen. They don't have enough weapons on the perimeter con- to continually stretch the field, so they're missing Jeremy Macklin. They're missing Deshaun Jackson badly. Quarterback position is something that's still unsettled. For as much as Mark Sanchez may be an upgrade over Sam Bradford, and I believe he is, mm-hmm. you see, again, crucial mistakes. And you know how that city is. Yeah. That's something they won't accept. And defensively, they just didn't compete. So, basically, it sounds like the wide receiver position, the quarterback position, and the fact that they didn't compete yesterday. Uh, what to you was the – uh, you know, the underlining reason where the true problem lied with that game yesterday? Well, that game yesterday was the defensive side of the ball. But I, the one part where I'll disagree with Lewis, and I think they competed. I, I, I just don't think they played well. I, I think you saw uh, specifically at the linebacker position, Kiko Alonso is not the same guy. He's not ready to play. Uh, and once you start giving off those big runs, play action comes into it, and that makes it different for the defensive backfield. So, I saw the effort. I just saw a bunch of guys who didn't play well. Uh, We were ahead of the curve. I'm going to toot our own horns, Mike, because we've been talking about how bad this wide receiver core was dating back to training camp. Uh, When everyone else was saying there's a lot of talent there, we were pointing out this was not a good group. Now, I didn't think it was going to be this bad uh, because, as I've said, I think this is number 32. Uh, there are 32 teams in this league, and this is number 32. If you were to rate the wide receiver position from one uh, at the top of the league all the way down to the bottom, they have the worst group of outside receivers in professional football, and that's an issue for whoever is playing quarterback, whether it's Mark Sanchez, whether it's Sam Bradford, or whether it's Thad Lewis moving forward, whether it would be Nick Foles, doesn't matter. It's hard to – to be consistent with this group outside the numbers. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, last night, if you're watching Arizona play, I mean, Palmer is just hosing it down the field yesterday to on that late drive when they got into field goal position to win that game. I mean, he's just launching that ball down the field, zipping it 15 and, and 16, 17 yards at a pace, and you're thinking, man, look how easy uh, he makes that happen. This team just can't do it. Uh, is it because they don't have the personnel, or is it Kelly not calling the plays, or does he not call those plays because he knows he doesn't have the personnel? Well, where Lewis hit the nail on the head is this offense is based on space, and without Deshaun Jackson, without Jeremy Macklin, they've been unable to create the spacing. So it, it not only affects those deep throws down the field, as you mentioned, it affects everything underneath. The running backs don't have as much space to do their job, the tight ends don't have as much space. The slot receiver, Jordan Matthews, uh, is more confined. So it's a trickle-down effect to the entire offense. And I, I think that's been the biggest issue. Uh, whether you have both would be great, but you need at least one. Uh, and that's where the fact is I've, I've consistently said the Eagles made a huge mistake by Jer- letting Jeremy Macklin get to free agency because at that point with his history – playing at school of Missouri, getting drafted by Andy Reid, you knew he was going to want to go back home. So that was one of those deals where they had to ex- extend him before he had the opportunity. And that were, will perhaps go down as the biggest mistake of this offseason because the Eagles have gotten nowhere near replacing it. All right, uh, I want you to listen to this uh, comment from Antonio Pierce because he was asked about comparing this 
to when he was in Washington with Spurrier. And I want to see if you see any parallels. Take a listen. It's funny. I said this two years ago uh, when Chip Kelly came in. And it was very similar to my situation, my second year in the league, when Steve Spurrier took over the Washington Redskins. A college coach came in with a lot of success, um, brought an offense in that was just lighting up in college. But in the pros, uh, you try to go get your guys. You know, and in the NFL, and, and we do try to give coaches credit and players maybe too much sometimes, but you need guys. You need players. You need personnel to run what you want to run. And when you have that much control and you've taken away so much talent from a team and you watch them perform, and it, even at the quarterback position, I mean, to have Mark Sanchez and Sam Bradford is, and going into the season thinking those are the guys – who want to win you a division title? You have to be crazy. So and essentially, he is saying that Chip <laughs> Kelly becoming the GM has crippled what Chip Kelly, the coach, was doing in the NFL. That's what I took from that. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it's a little much because these quarterbacks still might get him the division title. But that you know that speaks to the fact on how bad the division was when he won that power struggle. Mike, I wrote that week. This will be the death knell of Chip Kelly in Philadelphia. Mm. It's just a fact. It, it, uh, you've lost your buffer. Uh, everybody understands you're in charge. There's no excuses. When everything goes wrong, all fingers are pointed at you. I always point to Marcus Smith as a bust as a first-round pick. Well, you can kind of shrug that off and say, well, that might have been Howie's pick. You, you have a little bit plaus- You have a little plausible deniability. Chip Kelly no longer has that. Every single move on this team has its fingerprints on it, and when they don't work out, it's an issue. The the one part where Antonio is unquestionably correct is this league is about talent. It is not about scheme. Chip Kelly's belief is his scheme is the star of this organization. That's not how it works in the NFL. It might work that way at the college level. When this offense had Deshaun Jackson and Jeremy Macklin and LaShawn McCoy and Evan Mathis and all these Pro Bowl-level players, they were a top-five offense two years in a row. Uh, The offense can work with talent. The talent is deficient right now. Uh, And I would agree. We saw it work. We saw it be a top-five offense two years in a row. Either A, the talent is just simply unacceptably uh, unacceptable for what, what they have right now, or B, teams have figured them out. But I, I would think that even with poor to mediocre talent, there are times where this team uh, – I thought the first drive yesterday they had a good game plan. I thought they came out and, and really first did a good job. was great. Yeah, I mean, they got the ball to Aguilar the a couple times. Drive. Yeah. Zach Ertz had to drop on the second drive. They looked like they were about to go right down the field again. They were going to convert the third down, and Zach Ertz drops the football. And all of a sudden, everything changes from that point. It can happen that quickly in the NFL. But there's no question, this offense, people haven't figured it out. I'll tell you why. I know that for a fact, Mike. Because of the simplification of this offense, people figured out week three of his first year. He runs the same plays over and over and over again. It does not matter if the people know what's coming. Jimmy Johnson was very above board in his autobiography when he was talking about this great Cowboys team. They had three rushing plays, three. But it was Emmett Smith behind one of the great offensive lines in the history of this game. Everybody knew it was coming, and they couldn't stop it. That was similar to the Eagles' offense in the first two years. Everybody knows the plays he's going to run, but they couldn't stop it because of the talent on the field. The biggest issue with this team is the wide receiver group, and they can't carry their own water, and that's trickled down and affect the entire offense. All right, John and I will have plenty more on this tomorrow. We're live at the uh, Golden Nugget in Atlantic City. That should be a lot of fun uh, or not. Uh, take, uh, take us <laughs> – <laughs> Come on out and see us there tomorrow from uh, 2 yeah, to we 6. We can always talk about the 0-14 Sixers to, to, to yeah. rev it up. <laughs> All right, man. I'll see you tomorrow. All right, bud.